Dean Gillian, thanks for coming out tonight. Let's stand to our feet and worship the Lord together. See, that's out with us. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah. 
see the church.
Father God, we come before you tonight and we ask, desperately seeking for you to speak through your word and your Holy Spirit to apply that word right to each and every one of our hearts. Lord, empower me to uh, be your mouthpiece. And uh, Lord, I, I ask that I would, my opinions and my thoughts would get out of the way of your truth and how you want each and every one of us to respond. May we say yes to your spirit tonight. Because Lord, it's, your presence is truly what we need here. And, and Lord, uh, without you, we're meaningless and our life is directionless. And so, Lord, we ask that you would guide and direct. In Jesus' holy name, we pray. If you pray with me, church, tonight, say amen. amen. Our nation and every nation on the face of the earth and every people group always has a need to remember. Uh, because if we do not remember what has transpired in the past, the old saying is, if you don't know what your history is, you're bound to repeat it, whether it's good or bad. So if you were one of those people that came to our country fleeing uh, oppression and totalitarianistic governments from other parts of the world, and you were to come into our country by way of New York, at the southern tip of Manhattan, there's an island, Ellis Island. And on that island is a big memorial. It's called the Statue of Liberty. And it screams to everybody that came to this country that this place is known for the grace of freedom. Amen? Amen. And that it was a country free from the grip of oppression and, and cruel dictators and and governments that uh, just looked at people as something like a resource for their uses. There's also a, a memorial, and, and our, our nation's capital is full of them. Uh, one of my favorites is the, them raising the flag, this, the uh, memorial to Iwo Jima. And uh, that, that's, that's one of my favorite. And you, you just see it, and, and you, see, you, can, you can just see everything that it was costing our nation. But one of the most meaningful ones, when I was a little boy and my parents took me to Washington, D.C. for the first time, was the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. And that represented all of the men and women that died on the field and gave their life for the very reason we could place that Statue of Liberty and really mean it. Amen. Freedom came at a cost. And so the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier that is always guarded day and night, and to watch them switch over the guards is just inspiring, is it not? And, and the, the respect that they give to every single life that was laid down in sacrifice so that we could walk around screaming about our rights. Amen. That is the cost of freedom. And those memorials help us to remember, because if you look at today's world, m most people, uh, where was World War II fought? They can't even tell you. They can't tell you. If I, you were to mention to people, what, what does Iwo Jima mean to you? Most people 40 and under would say, Excuse me? Is that a new, like, technological toy? And they wouldn't understand why, because they haven't taken the time to remember. And when you lose the ability to remember or even know, then you're susceptible to danger in the future. The Bible tells us, and God is very clear in many of his parables, that he tells us by way of his parables and the rest of the totality of God's word tells us that our, that this, God's holy word, is our treasure map for life. That if you really want to find the treasure, the only way to do it is through God's word. And not only does he give us the treasure map, but he also gives us his spirit as the guide into the uncharted lands of 
a life of passion and adventure. The Bible doesn't tell us to go aimlessly without direction into this world and just, just be passionate about life, just, just live life to the fullest. No, that's the beer commercial. The Bible tells us to be passionate on purpose, to be passionate by principle. And God's Word is a roadmap, and the Spirit is the one guiding us in that roadmap to live life to the fullest. These monuments that all people groups erect in order to remember, some of them are quite unique. In fact, in America, there's a monument in Enterprise, Alabama. And it's a, a statue of a woman holding up a very large insect called a bow weevil. And that is the statue in the middle of town. And it goes back a full century, back to the 1910s, where that part of the world was run by one thing, and it was known as King Cotton. And almost everybody in that part of the world, they made their living, their whole livelihood depended on those cotton fields. And in 1915, a little insect invaded from Mexico called a bow weevil. This insect was only one quarter of an inch long. It was a little bug. But that little bow weevil with six legs was kind of fond of laying its eggs inside the pod of an early cotton plant, thus destroying its ability to bring forth a crop of cotton. Of course, the people there, like anyone else, thought that this spelled disaster for their economy and their future. And it forced them to look at alternatives to what they could produce. George Washington Carver was one of the scientists that helped that part of the country look at other things they could grow in those very same fields that weren't susceptible to the bow of weevil. And one of the things they turned to was peanuts and other various crops. They're still growing peanuts there. But in 1919, four years after this little bow weevil infected this and the town thought our life is over, they erected a statue to that bow weevil because without that seeming disaster, they would not have looked to alternatives, diversifying their ability to bring income to their families. They were actually blessed in a very uncommon way by that bow weevil. Wow. The Bible is full of monuments. The whole Levitical sacrificial system of offerings and sacrifices were designed to weakly remind the nation of Israel what life was about, what they were there for, and what God's role was in the whole things. You see, every single week, and in fact, in Jerusalem and the temple, every morning and every evening, a sacrifice was put on the altar so that you could not ever go in Jerusalem without coming across the smell of that sacrifice, reminding you daily as a memorial that the only way for you to be clean is through the sacrifice of someone else. What was it? It was a daily Remembrance. It was a daily memorial. Then we have the blue tassels on the bottom, the priestly robes that the priests wore in their responsibilities in the temple. And it tells us in Numbers chapter 15, 39, that these will serve as tassels for you to look at so that you may remember all the Lord's commands and obey them and not become unfaithful by following your own heart and your own eyes. Now think about this. The priest, as he's going about his priestly duties, God was very understanding that sometimes even the most Christian thing can become a job. And here's the priest, and their job was to serve the Lord daily in the temple. And he said, so it doesn't become a job to you. I'm going to put this special thing on your garment that's going to separate you from Everybody else was going. No one else was allowed to put these blue tassels on their, on, on their garment. That was a huge sin. Only the priest could wear this. And he could only wear it while he was doing 
his responsibilities in the temple. And it was to remind the priest as he felt those tassels hitting his legs, remember, God commanded this. This is a special service. Don't let it become a job. Don't let it become a job. It was a memorial right on their very clothes. Then how about all the festivals like the one we've been talking about lately, the Passover? God designed many of these and instructed the Jews to observe these festivals to remind themselves and their children about what he did for them. It's very easy in the busyness of life to forget what God has done for us. So Exodus 12 says, when your children ask you, what does this ritual mean to you? You are to reply, it is the Passover sacrifice to the Lord, for he passed over the houses of the Israelites in Egypt when he struck the Egyptians and spared our homes. So the people bowed down and worshiped. He said, set memorials in our life to remember. We are not really good at doing this. And God's people weren't either. That's why he designed many of them for them. He said, now do this. If you remember when they passed over into the very promised land that he had promised hundreds of years earlier to them, and which they were unable to accomplish, I want to remind the church, under Moses' leadership. Why? Because they took a vote on it. And democracy is not following God's leadership. Evidently, that's what the Bible teaches. Can I get an amen? Amen. Okay, I got three believers in here. Okay. That is so foreign to us in America, right? It's like, wait, 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 don't I have a say in that? Okay. When the children of Israel had a say, it cost them their life and a whole generation. Because what God had vision for them was bigger than their vision for themselves. Yeah. And so they voted. And they said, no, we can't go in. Giants are too big. Cities are too great. God's not able. And it cost their lives. But their kids under Joshua's leadership... Same giants, same cities. They didn't take a vote the second time. Under God's leadership through Joshua, Joshua said, get ready, three days we're going over. And of course, it was springtime, and the Jordan was at its height, and there was no way to get across. And God said, get the priest and the ark, and you walk down in that river first. Remember this? And so (laughs) here's the priest. They They got to grow some instant faith. Because they're walking down in that water. And they're like, Lord Jesus, help me now. And right when that ark got in the water, the Bible tells us that God stopped the water upstream. And all of a sudden, the water started going down, 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 and it was gone, and the people walked across on dry ground. And when they got across, God told them, set up 12 stones to remember what I did because when all the people got across, that water came back and trapped them in his promise. Amen? They're like, oh, no, going back now. And so 12 stones on the riverbank, it's like, ah, oh, anybody can set up 12 stones, but it says in Joshua 4, verse 4 through 7, so Joshua summoned 12 men he had selected from the Israelites, one man for each tribe, one stone for each tribe, and said to them, Go across to the ark of the Lord your God in the middle of the Jordan. Each of you lift a stone onto his shoulder, one for each of the Israel, Israelite tribes, so that this will be a sign among you. In the future, when your children ask you, well, what do these stones mean to you? That means go back, travel there, and look at them. You should tell them the waters of the Jordan were cut off in front of the ark of the Lord's covenant. And when it crossed the Jordan, the Jordan's waters were cut off. Therefore, these stones will always be a memorial for the Israelites. He said, put memorials so you remember that God comes through on his promise. Mm. What's the memorial for the people that voted against God? Where's their 12 stones? Or did they erect a memorial where they set 10 up for the 10 who voted against it and two stones for the Caleb and Joshua who voted for it? No. No memorials for that, because God doesn't want us to remember 
our, our failures. He wants us to remember what he has done for us. And so even though they were unfaithful to believe God's promise, he was still faithful to his promise and took those rebellious children of his into the promised land in spite of who they were. Interesting. Well, what's our memorial? The Lord's Supper and baptism. The Bible tells us in Luke 22 that when the Lord took bread, he gave thanks, he broke it, gave it to them and said, this is my body which is given for, for you. Do this in remembrance as, as a memorial of me. Paul writes the same thing in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 26. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. It's actually a living memorial to pass down from generation to generation and to remind us each time and every time we observe it that I have no life without the blood and body of Jesus Christ sacrificed for me. It's a memorial. So what should we remember about? What does the Bible tell us to remember? Well, that's point number two. If we're going to put memorials in our life, the memorials should first of all tell us that it's all about God. Our flesh, my flesh, your flesh, the way I wake up naturally every day tells me it's all about me. That's what it does. I'm born that way. Every time we say, don't I get a vote, that's saying it's about me, right? When do I get a say? When do I get to determine? We have determined our our life. And yet, guess what we did? We turned it into a sin fest. Right? Right? We brought death. When our forefathers, Adam and Eve, when they had a choice, when they had a vote, they voted against life. They voted for death. Why do we then trust ourselves so much? Against what God's Word says. It defies logic that we would follow the path of our forebears, Adam and Eve, into destruction when God says he has come through his word and his spirit to give us life and give us life more abundantly. Wow. That's preaching, Tom. I'm, I'm getting sighted on Wednesday night. Isn't that amazing? Okay, so what are we, how do you remember it's all about God? Well, first of all, we need to remember who and whose we are. We, may, we need to first of all remember who we are. We are sinners saved by grace. And who do we belong to? We belong to the one who paid for us. We are not our own. Paul says in Corinthians, we have been purchased, bought with a price. The life of Jesus Christ. My life isn't mine now. I get in trouble when I start thinking, well, oh, this is my life. That's when I get in trouble. Because that thinking is antithesis to God's thinking. It's the exact opposite. God says, no, you don't belong to you. You belong to me. I'm the one that died for you. Our life has been purchased. And when that means we are purchased and, as Paul said, a bond slave, that means we don't get a vote anymore. That's what it means. He's the master. I'm the servant. When I live life abundantly, it means, Lord, what is your say in this? But the great thing about this transformation is he always wants better for us than what we want for ourselves. See? So we remember whose and whose we are. We're not our own. Secondly, we need to remember our purpose, what we're here for. Matthew 22, the Lord tells us, this Jesus preaching, he said to him, Love the Lord your God. This is Jesus' words. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the greatest and most important command. The second is just like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. As Jesus summarizes all the requirements of God's holy law. And what is God's Ten Commandments? It's a test of our heart and obedience. It reveals who we really are. All left to our own devices. And so as Jesus reminds his questionnaires about, they, well, uh, what do you believe all the law and prophets are? And so he gives the top two. Love God with everything that you are, 
your whole soul and love your neighbor as yourself. What he does is he, so beautifully, he says, this is the opposite of a life of being self-absorbed. That's what he did. He said, love God with everything you are. Love your neighbor. Who's left out of the conversation? Me. Nowhere does it say, well, my problem is I don't love me enough. When Christians say that, my skin crawls. Most of our problem is because we're absolutely head over heels about ourselves. And we can't even think about anybody else. That's why when he summarizes all the law, he says, focus on loving God and focus on loving your brother. And it removes, it's the opposite of being self-absorbed. And what's the problem with the society we live in? They're self-absorbed. They can't even walk through a concourse or a store or anything because why? They're looking at their thing. They're so self-absorbed, they'll walk into walls, people today. Can't drive straight. Why? Self-absorbed. Who cares about the people around you? Who cares? It doesn't matter as long as I get to look at what I want to look at. What is it? It's being self-absorbed. Nobody else matters. You don't even exist. Don't even exist. God wants to save us from that. And so he reminds us in Scripture that it's all about him. By remembering who and whose we are, remembering our purpose, and third, remembering to live in the presence of God. What this means is practicing the presence of God on a daily basis. It means being consumed by the presence of God in our daily life. It means my thoughts being centered around him. My mindset, my attitudes, my words being centered around him. We typically just let it fly. Well, you know what you said was, oh, I didn't mean that. Why? But it's not centered around Christ. It's just centered around, well, that's what I think. That's what my opinion is. It's what my vote is. And that, once again, it really worked for Adam and Eve. I mean, they only had one, man. They didn't have to, just one. I mean, they blew it huge. God said, please don't do that. You'll die when you do. Our relationship will end as we know it then. And what? They became self-absorbed. And they decided, my opinion, my thought, my vote is more important than God's. And can we just say right now, thanks, Adam and Eve, Okay. Right. Of course, before we were too hard on them, I'd have been at that tree the first day. Maybe it took them a week. Maybe a month. Maybe six months because they were, you know, purely innocent. Me? Stay away from that tree. <laughs> right? I'd have been panting after it the moment God said don't. It's just like what we're doing as a church starting Sunday. You... You don't have to participate. It's not a law, but we're asking for you to participate in a fast, to deny yourself some treats, because we haven't for the last month. We've been on a treat train, right? And it's not about the food. Like, I I don't want to deny myself food. Okay, just don't watch TV for a week. Oh, don't worry about that. Just... Deny me the food. Right? Right. Just pick something. Because whatever you pick and say, I'm going to give that up so I can focus more on the Lord, it's going to be an all-out battle. I don't care if you say, I'm not wearing black socks that week. You will have a desire all week to wear black socks. Because why? Because you're telling your flesh, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to be in charge. And the minute you tell your flesh that, it says, oh, yeah. Black socks, black socks, black socks. Oh, I see them in my dream. They're walking by. I'm invaded. Everybody that walks by, black socks. And at work, they had a black sock day on Tuesday. 
They never had that before. It's all a temptation. Right. You know, I'm having fun with that right now. Okay, just, just want to make sure. So how do, we, how do we defeat that? That's what fasting does. It teaches us to live in the presence of God rather than just by our whims, rather than just not thinking about it. And as soon as we tweak the flesh just a little bit, it starts kicking a fuss. Some of you are already like, oh, coffee, 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 coffee. Why? You're already mad. You haven't even denied yourself mad. You're mad already. You know what that is? It's a God. It's that simple. You're like, well, who are you to do? Pick another fast that includes caffeine. I don't care. Whatever you choose to deny yourself. The flesh is going to say, not on my watch. And it's going to fight you tooth and nail. Why? Because it's teaching ourselves by practice that it's not about me. It's about God. And we're actually starving the flesh and feeding the spirit. Yeah. It's exciting. Because it helps us to remember it's all about God. Point number three. It's also life. We put these memorials, and Scripture has all these memorials to remind us it's not just all about God, but it's also all about surrendering to that God. See, there's a lot of Christians like, oh, yeah, it's all about God. You're going to surrender? Nope. But it's all about God. You're going to obey? Nope. But it's all about God. Man, we, got, we, got the, we can say it in special ways. We'll pray about it. God, it's all about you. You're going to submit? Nope. But it's all about you, God. Bless me. Pray, I praise you. <laughs> and what does he say in Scripture about that? It's better to obey than sacrifice. Right. No, we don't want to do what he says. We just want to tell him he's wonderful. And so, number three, it's all about surrendering. Once you know it's about him, then we have to surrender to that. So how do we surrender it? Well, the first thing the Scripture says is we share in his crucifixion. Now, on a daily basis, i got to take my mindset, my opinion, my vote, and I need to take a big old knife to it and kill it. By myself. Nobody else making me, no, voluntarily self-sacrifice. It says in Romans 6, 6, For we know that our old self was crucified with him in order that sin's Dominion, its rule over my life may be abolished so that we may no longer be a slave to sin. Amen. You want to stop being a slave to sin? How does it happen? You have to die to it because sin can't have an effect over a dead person. So we die to its effect. So that old guy, that old guy that used to listen to you, he's dead. I'm going to live by the new man, this new creation. I'm going to listen with my spirit's ears instead of my fleshly ears. I don't know about you, but my fleshly ears are a bigger set than my spiritual ears. You're like, yeah, we can tell. Look at those things. Now, I'm not just talking about the size of them. I'm talking about their influence in my life. I listen to those impulses, man, just like that, right? I don't have to train my ears to hear my flesh say, well, I I think it ought to be like this. I don't have to train myself to do that, but I do have to train my spiritual ears to hear God's voice over my flesh listening to my physical wants. Yeah. (laughs) And my emotional wants and my intellectual wants and all those other wants. So Paul says in Galatians 2.20, And I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live in this same body, I live by faith, by trusting in the Son of God, what his word says, who loved me and gave himself for me. Hopefully part of your Christmas observance is not only coming to church and and the great, the, the, the wonderful Christmas songs we sing, which really we should sing them all year, although we'd get tired of them. But because uh, singing about the birth of Christ, I mean, it should never get old, right? And, and uh, 
But think about this. We watch special things that time of year that we don't watch. And one of the things, hopefully, that is part of your Christmas observance is watching Jimmy Stewart and It's a Wonderful Life. Because in that story, we see a man who wasn't appreciating life, and then that trauma hits him, and all of a sudden he has a new appreciation for God's blessing in his life. And he goes home with such hysterical joy, he acts like a madman, does he not? And it makes the whole movie, right? When he's like, oh, everybody's like, <laughs> you know, it's like Scrooge waking up to the truth. And all of a sudden, everything before that was, oh, now it brings him hysterical joy. Why? Because he's finally surrendered to what God wanted. Amen. There are some men in the Bible that surrendered. And they're famous names now, not because they were greater than us, but because of their surrender, the depth of their surrender. And they, they will forever be known by their surrender. The first name I can think of is Job. When you say that name, what comes to mind is his surrender to God. I mean, of all the people, like his wife said, just curse God and die, just give up. Job says, no, no, no. Mm -mm. He had, I mean, you talk about the circumstances and of somebody who should quit on God. He said, no. No. Listen to what he said, how he surrendered to what God was allowing in his life. In the first chapter, it said, Then Job stood up, verse 20, tore his robe, shaved his head, he fell to the ground, and worshipped. In the midst of his tragedy. And all the shaving of his head, it was all of his sorrow and grief, but he shaved his head, fell to the ground, worshipped the Lord, saying, Naked came I from my mother's womb. Naked I will leave this life the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Praise the name of Yahweh, the all-powerful, almighty God. And throughout all this, Job did not sin or blame God for anything. Let me read that again. Throughout all of this, Job did not sin or blame God for anything anything. Can we even get through the week without blaming God for something? How he did not come through for us. Yet Job has a whole book in the Bible dedicated to his name to show us that God is bigger than the most dramatic circumstances you could ever dream of. This man said, no, God will take care of me. I know it doesn't look like it right now, but God will take care of me. Why? He understood God was, that life was all about God and surrendering to him as he knew him. His friends didn't get it. His friends missed it and tried to talk him into thinking like them, and he said, no, I know who God is, and he has a purpose in all this. And Job surrendered and he is forever, you can't name his friends' names. It's in Scripture. You can't name them. But you can name the, you can name the man that surrendered, Job. How about this guy, Jonah? We don't, we don't know what kind of a sea creature it was. Boy, there's so much arguments in the theological books about that. Like, it matters. It doesn't matter. The fish isn't the famous part of the story. Jonah's the famous part of the story because we so, he so resonates with us. God said, I want you to go be a blessing to your enemies. And everything, every fiber is being said, no, I do not want to be a blessing to your, my enemies, man. I mean, I totally get that, don't you? I mean, Job might be, the chapter should read Tom. I get that. Go save people. Go, go tell people you don't like about Jesus. No. I'd rather talk to people I kind of like, right? But God said, no, go to, go to Israel's enemies. Go to the people that have already prophesied. They're, I'm going to use them as a tool to spank Israel. Go to them. 
And Jonah said, not going to do it. Not going to do it. Now, him saying no to God, that doesn't make him famous. Pretty much everybody in Scripture said no to God. That's just normal. No, it was when he stubbornly refused, and even to the point of death, he was like, I would rather die than submit. And God had the sailor, I mean, he said, go ahead, throw me in the drink. At least you'll be saved. The sailors, they tried everything but that. They finally said, okay, well, we, <laughs> we want to live, so hey, sorry, Dan. The sailors came to know Jehovah. They worshiped him. They obeyed him, but Jonah wouldn't until he went to the deep. And then when he went to the deep, he finally surrendered. Amen. Look what it took to get him to surrender. Jonah 2.9, but as for me, I will sacrifice to you with a voice of thanksgiving. When's he saying this? In the drink. I will fulfill what I have vowed. Salvation is from the Lord. And Jonah is famous for that moment of what? Surrender. That moment of surrender. How about this guy? Zacchaeus. He was a wee little man. A wee little man was he, right? If you grew up in Sunday school like I did, you know this song. He climbed up in the sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. And as the Savior passed that way, he looked up the tree. Zacchaeus, you come down. Well, I'm coming to your house today. Yeah, we sang that as little kids. And we would love singing that. It taught that that's, that's how do you teach theology to children. You put in a song, they remember it the rest of their life. Isn't that amazing? Well, who was Zacchaeus? Zacchaeus was a chief tax collector. He was great at ripping off his brothers for Rome and getting rich in the process. Wow, what a traitor. And the Lord picked him and said, Zacchaeus, I'm coming to your house. Amen. Come to your house. He didn't decide to go to the Pharisee's house or the Sadducee's house or the religious leaders of that town. He said, no, Zacchaeus, I'm going to Did he... Did Jesus send the tongues talking? They were all outside Zacchaeus' house. I can't believe he said that. He should know. If he's a prophet, he's from God, he should know who this is. He shouldn't be communing with these people. Well, he's in there turning Zacchaeus into one of his four-star generals. That's what he was doing. And as soon Jesus doesn't even say anything. His presence in Zacchaeus' house. Zacchaeus just offers this. He says, Lord... I'm going to pay back everybody I ripped off four times what I took. So in other words, he lays down his riches. He just gives them up because he's found the true treasure, Jesus Christ. What is it? Surrender. Total surrender. He just gives up his whole way of thinking, his whole way of living, his whole way of, of earning a living. He said, I'm done. I got you now. Amen. Who does that? People that get known in Scripture, Zacchaeus. Listen to what it says, Zacchaeus 19, 8. But Zacchaeus stood there, said to the Lord, Look, I give half of my possession to the poor, Lord, and if I have exhorted anything from anyone, I'll pay back four times as much. What did he do? He completely surrendered. Amen. And he is eternally famous for it. And of course, I can't get off surrender without mentioning Paul. Amen. Yeah. I mean, Paul was surrender king, wasn't he? I mean, he, he wasn't even Paul before he was Saul, the Christian killer. And I mean, he was good at his job. He loved his job. He really believed with every fiber of who he was that Christianity was something that needed to be eradicated no matter what the cost. And he was good at it. He was wreaking havoc in the church in its early days. And in Philippians 3, after, after Saul met Jesus and became Paul, he recounts it for us in the book of Philippians as he's sitting in jail for Jesus. Before he had the life, man, have you ever heard people give their testimony? And it always kind of bothers me when, when they make it sound what they gave up was more fun than what they received from Jesus. Oh, man, I gave up this, and I was living the life. It's like, really? Because it sounds like death. Wow. 
Man, I was partying. I was this. I was that. It was, it was fun. But now, a, now I follow Jesus. It's horrible. Praise the name of the Lord. Man, we need to be careful, right? We didn't give up anything for Jesus. He gave it all up for us. Man. So Paul understood that. He said, man, I didn't give up everything. What I gave up for him was manure. He said, oh, you can't say that in church. Okay, I'll let Paul say it. Verse 8 of Philippians, the third chapter. While he's in jail for telling people about Jesus, is more than that, I also consider everything to be a loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Because of him, I have suffered the loss of all things and consider them, there's the manure word. Everything that I used to consider something of value, it's manure compared to me having Jesus so that I may gain him. Man, we shouldn't let people, we shouldn't ever preach the testimony of what we gave up for Jesus. We need to preach what Jesus gave up for us. That's what surrender is. And of course, who surrendered the most? Jesus Christ. And there was, there was no place where it said he deserved it. There was nothing about us that said we could earn it. Or he owed us. There was a debt to be paid. Oh, no, no. We deserved judgment. We deserve what the Bible calls condemnation. We ran from the shepherd and bishop of our soul. And being the good shepherd he is, he ran after us and pursued us. And he surrendered his life to the most grievous form of death there is, crucifixion, agonizing, not easy, the most difficult. I mean, just, we just take for granted the lowering of, from God who can speak life into existence to becoming one of those very lower life forms that he submitted to so that he could be a savior. We just pass right by that. You know? It's like saying, okay, tonight at church, you have an opportunity to become something else that you've never been before, okay? I'm going to walk through this special thing out in the lobby, and presto change you, you're going to go from a human to a worm. So who's up for it? But listen, if you become a worm, you're going to feed some walleye in Lake Erie. So that's what it's about. You're going to save them in the process, okay? So who's, who wants to sign up? I'm not doing that. Well, what I just, the story I just planned is not enough humbling compared to what Jesus did for us. Amen. Yeah, he lowered himself even more than that. Amen. And so it says in conclusion, what's, what's it about? What's this life about? It's about being like Jesus. And in Philippians 2, Paul writes, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even to death on the cross. That's what life, you want to live a passionate life? That's what it's about, surrender. That's how we get the abundant life. We know what we're here for. We're here for the Lord, and we surrender to it. And when we do that, we get to live that abundant life, that passionate, adventurous life that other people look at and say, how'd you get that? Is, is there a store where I can purchase? No, no. It's surrendering. Surrender. And it goes against everything that we wake up as every day. It it's totally runs a, against the current of our natural way of thinking. But that's how to be used by God. Amen. And that's when life becomes truly adventuresome. Amen. Amen? Let's bow our heads and close our eyes and pray tonight as the musicians get in place. Father God, we lift up our hearts and minds tonight. Our Lord, we fully admit that we are living much less the life of adventure and surrender to you and much more the life of demand of our flesh. And Lord, for this we ask forgiveness. 
And Lord, we ask that you would place a right spirit in our hearts and minds, one of surrender so we can experience what Job and Jonah and Zacchaeus and Paul experienced, this thing that passes understanding, this thing that makes the world look at it and say, you're crazy, right? I don't get it. Because of your life within us and our surrender to it, being eternally minded rather than today and this week and focus on my mind, my view, my opinion, my feelings, my thought, but totally being saturated with your presence so that we can become more like you, living above the nonsense of this life. Lord, help us. Give us a vision for that kind of living. And as you give us that vision, give us an appetite for it. Next week as we fast, give us a spiritual appetite. Give that to us, we pray. In Jesus' holy name, if you pray with me, church, say amen. Let's stand to our feet and let's pray. Let's sing about exalting the Lord in our life. Oh, I will exalt.